The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him in those who hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out his hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. We are in Deuteronomy chapter 10 now. And we're starting with verses 1 through 11 today. Deuteronomy 10 verse 1. At that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. And then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bene Ja'akan to Moserah, where Aaron died and where he was buried. And Eleazar, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. From there they journeyed to Gudgoda, and from Gudgoda to Jotpata, a land of rivers of water. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance just as the Lord your God promised him. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. My friend, Will Groban, some of you here know him, got his master's degree at Dallas Theological Seminary in Biblical, Hebrew, and Greek. I remember him emailing me once and saying how complicated the simple Greek word ice was to translate. In fact, in his email, he said that he felt like he had broken his brain, and I believe the word ice was a large part of that. I felt bad for him. A broken brain is a difficult thing. You can't do much good until your brain gets fixed. I broke my brain over this passage that we're looking at today. It happens from time to time. There are things that are so complicated, it's hard to think them through. This is especially true with verses 6 and 7. They seem to have absolutely nothing to do with the surrounding text. And on the surface, they seem completely contradictory to anyone who has read the parallel passages in Numbers. 
Indeed, that is what Albert Barnes, a person I respect very highly, said about them. Albert Barnes says, after this, we now have four verses, Deuteronomy 10, 6, 10, 7, Deuteronomy 10, 8, and Deuteronomy 10, 9, which not only have no kind of connection with the verses before and after them, but also as they stand in the present Hebrew text, directly contradict that very text. And the first two of these verses have not, in our Hebrew text, the least connection with the last two of them. Is that so? Our text verse comes from Proverbs 30. It is verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. If Albert Barnes is right, then what we have is not the word of God. He gives several corrective possibilities to restore your confidence in the word. However, I would suggest to you that he is just plain wrong, and you will agree with me at the end of this sermon. So would the late scholar Charles Ellicott. I was grateful to read Ellicott's commentary as it saved me oodles of time and an even greater broken brain. His insights were well received, even if I didn't go with his conclusions. While typing, I did say out loud to the Lord that I can't wait to thank Ellicott someday when I get the chance. Now, how can I do that if he's already dead? Because death is just an insignificant blip on the way to glory. For those who have come to Christ, they should be confident that this is true. And how does such a change come about? Well, a portion of it is found right in our verses today. There is a great and sure hope that we possess, and pictures of it are indeed found in these verses. They are a small but tasty delight found in the greater tapestry that we call the Holy Bible. Great things are to be found in his superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. This is our last sermon of the year, by the way, mm -hmm. just so you know. Our first thought today is the two tablets. It's verses one through five. The coming verses are closely connected to what ended our verses in the previous passage. There it said, thus I prostrated myself before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Therefore, I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and your outstretched arm. In connection with that event, but just prior to it came the words that open our passage today. In other words, verses 10, 1 through 3 are logically followed by verses 9, 25 through 29. Then verses 10, 4, and 5 follow that. Understanding the chronology, we begin now with verse 1, at that time, ba'et hahiv, in the time, the that. These words set the tone for what follows. It is speaking of the time at Horeb, as was noted in verse 9, 8. It says there, also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. What is presented here is not a chronological account, but one that is rhetorical. It takes what is more precisely recorded in Exodus, and it lays it out in a short synopsis of what took place without regard to the order in which the events occurred. Verse 1 continues, the Lord said to me, as just noted, this logically precedes what was said at the end of the previous chapter. Without getting bogged down in the chronology, which has already been provided, the main focus is on these few lines of historical narrative. Now the Lord says, verse 1 going on, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and come up to me on the mountain. The word stone is plural. Tablets of stones, like the first. The words here follow after the narrative of Exodus 34. There it said, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone, like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. 
There is a difference between the first set of stones and the second that cannot go unnoted. The first set of stones was made by God, as it says in Exodus 32. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. The first set of tablets were made by God, and the words on them were written out by God as well. However, for this second set of tablets, the Lord instructs Moses to hew them and bring them up to him. As these will be like the first, they bear the same appearance. They will also be used for the same purpose as well. The fact that the Lord asks Moses to make the tablets rather than being made by him shows that these are to be considered just as acceptable for the bearing of the law. Otherwise, he would have to again make them himself. Along with hewing the tablets, the Lord says, verse 1 continues, and make yourself an ark of wood. Like the number of times Moses ascended the mountain, these words provide a second difficulty. Is this a temporary ark for the keeping of the tablets until the actual ark of the testimony is made? Or is this simply a reminder that the tablets are to be set in the ark once it is completed? What seems most probable is that only one ark was made. Verse 5 seems to indicate this. And so what seems likely is that the tablets were made by Moses. He carried them up to the Lord. The Lord gave his instruction and wrote out the Ten Commandments on the tablets. Eventually, the Ark of the Covenant was made by the artificers, and at that time, the tablets were placed in the Ark. Here's what it says. And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. So Moses raised up the tabernacle, fastened its sockets, set up its boards, put in its bars, and raised up its pillars. And he spread out the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark, inserted the poles through the rings of the ark, and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, hung up the veil of the covering, and partitioned off the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. If there was only one ark made, then what Moses is presenting here is simply a snapshot of the events to remind the people of the things that occurred without regard to the lesser details the specific time frames, or the actual chronology. This will become more evident when we come to the events of verses 6 through 9. The intent, then, is to highlight Israel's time of disobedience, the mercies that they received, and the long-suffering of the Lord throughout their time in the wilderness. For now, the narrative of the tablets hewn out by Moses continues as he recounts the words of the Lord to him. Verse 2, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets. It would appear that these tablets were of lesser quality. If the Lord made the first two, then there would have been the perfection of the Lord's handiwork on them, wouldn't there? Both in the tablets and in the writing. However, one would think the tablets made by the hands of man would bear the imperfections of man, and only the words would reflect the perfect character of the Lord. But As noted, it is obvious the Lord feels both sets were suitable for the purpose of conveying his words, regardless as to how the tablets themselves came to be. It is the words, then, the words of law, that are considered by the Lord to have the importance above all else. And there is the truth that the stones, though shaped through man, still came from the Lord originally anyway. It is his creation And so the stones are his, regardless as to how they came to reflect the words which bear his moral standards. Concerning the first set that bore that moral standard, he says to Moses, verse 2 continues, which you broke. Moses, who stands as representative of the law, is said to be the one who broke the tablets. The Lord reminds him of this. The Lord had Moses make a new set of tablets that will replace the first. Verse 2 going on, and you shall put them in the ark. Moses will receive back the tablets, and it is he who is to deposit them in the ark. In obedience to the words of the Lord, it says, verse 3, So I made an ark of acacia wood. Three possibilities can be supposed from these words. Either one, a temporary ark was made to hold the tablets. Two, Moses had Bezalel make the wooden part of the ark, having it ready for his descent from the mountain. Or three, Moses is simply speaking out events in an order for the people to understand that what he was instructed was accomplished. Based on Exodus 40, verse 20, which we cited earlier, the last option seems the most likely. 
Moses is simply relaying the events in accord with the word of the Lord without regard to a set chronology. It is no different than when it later says that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. The meaning is that he was the one who instructed and oversaw the building of it, just as it is here with Moses and the ark. What is of note is that because of how the events are relayed here, Mosaic authorship is absolutely certain. Anyone else would have entered the words as they had read them from Exodus, not wanting to confuse the narrative and diminish the reliability of their cause in the process of conveying it. Moses, however, would be unconcerned with such things. For now, he next notes, verse 3 continues, hewed two tablets of stone like the first. The ark is mentioned first followed by the hewing of the stones. And then thirdly, Moses says, verse three going on, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. With the stones prepared, Moses, picturing the law, ascended the mountain with the stones in his hand, meaning in his possession. Upon ascending the mountain, Moses next speaks of the work of the Lord. Verse four, and he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing. As noted in verse two, it is the Lord who wrote on the tablets, despite the fact that they were hewn out by Moses or someone Moses appointed to do it. Everything that was written on the first set was again written by the Lord on the second set. It was, verse 4 continues, the Ten Commandments. Asheret HaDevarim, the Ten Words, meaning commandments. Verse 4 continues, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. This was recorded in Exodus 20, and then it was repeated to Israel on the banks of the Jordan in Deuteronomy chapter 5, reminding them of what occurred, even before the eyes of the people. Those same words were inscribed on the tablets, verse 4 continues, and the Lord gave them to me. Like before, the Lord gave the tablets to Moses, picturing the law. The first time he received them, he came down the mountain and cast them out of his hands, breaking them. The second time, however, verse 5, then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. As the first time, Moses descended with the tablets, but this time they were tablets he had made and upon which the Lord had written. And this time, instead of casting them out of his hands, he secreted them away in the ark, as he then notes, which I had made. An important point is that the timing of an event in the Hebrew is based on the context of what is occurring. Thus, the words had, made, depend on what Moses is referring to. As he is speaking almost 40 years after the event, it is in relation to what he had once instructed those people many years before. In other words, Moses instructed Bezalel to make the ark according to the word of the Lord. That was done. And so for Moses to say, I put the tablets in the ark which I had made, could have been some time after descending the mountain. Hence, as we saw earlier, it is probable that only one ark was made, and he is referring to that. With this in mind, he then says, verse 5 going on, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. The tablets were placed in the ark, and they remained in there, even until the day where Israel sat on the banks of the Jordan, receiving the words of Moses in preparation for their entry through the Jordan and into the land of promise. Further, they are even recorded as having remained in the ark hundreds of years later, at the time when Solomon built the temple, as is seen in 1 Kings 8, verse 9. Our first thought, part A, pictures of Christ. With varying detail, what Moses has said in these first five verses was also detailed in Exodus 34, 1 through 4, which we cited earlier. There are two sets of tablets that were made. The first were made by the Lord, and they were written on by the Lord. The second were hewn by Moses, and the same words as at first were written on them by the Lord. Therefore, what is written on the tablets, meaning the basis for the law, is what calls for the main attention. The law is on both, but one set is broken while the other is secreted away in the ark. In this, we have a picture of Adam and of Christ. The first set of tablets pictures Adam. The first tablets were made by God and engraved by God, as it said in Exodus 32. Now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Adam was created by the Lord God, Genesis 2, verse 7. And he was given the law by him, Genesis 2, 16, and 17. However, Adam broke the law, Genesis 3, verse 6. The second set pictures Christ. 
They were made by Moses, Deuteronomy 10, verse 1. But the words were still engraved by the Lord, Deuteronomy 10, verse 2. Jesus came through man. He was not directly created by God as Adam was. Rather, his body was prepared by God throughout the history of man under law. It is reflective of the words of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Christ came to do the will of God. He was born under God's law. Thus, the second tablets were also written by the Lord. In contrast to Adam, who broke God's law, pictured by Moses destroying the first set of tablets, Jesus never broke it. Rather, to fit the pattern of Christ, Moses secreted them away in, as it says, the Ark of Acacia Wood. Remembering the typology of that from Exodus shows us Christ's humanity. The acacia, or shittim wood, is the base material for the Ark. Its heartwood is a dark reddish brown, and it is beautiful when it's sanded and polished. That pictures Christ's humanity. He, a son of Adam from the Middle East, would bear the same general color as the wood. As Shittim is an incorruptible wood, it pictures his incorruptible nature. Though a man, he never sinned. Further, Shittim is a thorny tree. Its name comes from a root, Shotet, signifying scourging thorns. The very wood testifies to the trials Christ would endure in his passion for the reconciliation of man. It is into this ark that the unbroken tablets were deposited, signifying Christ's perfect fulfillment and embodiment of the law. On the top was placed the mercy seat, and the picture of the work of Christ as our place of propitiation before God is then seen. Considering what we have here, it is evident that God's law is permanent. The same law was inscribed on both sets of tablets. However, being permanent, they can still be broken. In the first, God knew Moses would break them, picturing the breaking of the law by Adam and all who are in Adam. However, the second set was unbroken. In this, it reveals Christ and all who are in Christ. It shows us that sin comes through the law, but for those in Christ, they are no longer under law, but under grace. Sin is no longer imputed to those who have moved from Adam to Jesus. Tablets of stone which bring words of condemnation, words which prick my very soul. How can I live up to such a standard? I see only damnation. How can my name ever be written on heaven's scroll? The word stands against me and show me my sin. They were meant to bring life, but only death do they bring. The man who lives by them, who is he? We're all done in. From where can life come? Show me such a spring. So has ended the strife I now fully see. God himself has condemned sin in the flesh through Jesus. Marvelous words of life. To God the glory be. Such a marvelous thing he has done for us. Our second thought today, inheritances of water. It's verses 6 and 7. We now arrive at a couple verses that are probably the most difficult of all to be found in Deuteronomy. So much is this the case that they are claimed to be incorrect, contradictory, later insertions, and so on. If they were later insertions, think it through, folks, they would not be inserted in such a difficult manner. So that can be tossed right out on its ear. As being incorrect, the Samaritan Pentateuch claims to be the correct text, realigning things as they supposedly should be. But then why would somebody intentionally twist up the Hebrew text? No way. Rather, it appears the Samaritan Pentateuch purposefully changed the text to avoid the difficulties. Further, the Greek matches the Hebrew, so we know which is correct. Assuming there are contradictions is as simple as assuming that one's opinion as to why these verses are written as they are is correct and that there are, in fact, contradictions. It could be as simple as that Moses is trying to make a spiritual point concerning a particular issue and he is doing it by purposefully making the text overtly complicated in the process. And that's what's happening. One fact to note is that the other historical writings in Deuteronomy are in the first person. We did this and we did that. However, here they are in the third person. The children of Israel did this and the children of Israel did that. 
Moses is obviously tying in what occurred in the reception of the tablets with what he is speaking of now. This is especially so because he will return to the time at Horeb for verses 8 through 11. The New King James Version makes verses 6 through 9 parenthetical, but this is not correct. Only 6 and 7 are. From there, the narrative returns to the time at Mount Horeb. Because these two verses are parenthetical, we have to try to determine why this diversion is being made. He begins with verse 6, Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bene Ja'akan to Moserah. Ubene Yisrael naseu mi be'erot bene ya'akan moserah. And children Israel set out from wells bene ya'akan to Moserah. Numbers 33, 31 seems to say exactly the opposite. And so it is immediately assumed that the text is corrupt, contradictory, and so on. It says there, they departed from Moserot and camped at Bene Ja'akan. So it sounds like it's exactly the opposite thing. Bene Ja'akan means sons of twisting, meaning perverting. Moserah here is singular. In Numbers 33, it is plural. One must assume that they are in the same place. Moserah comes from a word meaning bond, but that comes from a word signifying chastisement. It could be, like several of the other locations that they visited in their travels, they simply named a particularly unhappy spot Moserah, signifying the chastisement of the place. This is especially so because it does not say they encamped at these locations as it did in the book of Numbers, only that they journeyed. Or, if the same location, a change in the direction of travel is as simple as recognizing that in Numbers chapter 20, the people had petitioned to enter Edom in order to pass through. But Edom came out against them, and they turned back. Thus, the reversal of the order can be explained by them backtracking from the land they had previously encamped at. In Numbers 21 verse 4, it says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. As they had turned back, and as these are not encampments, it would explain why they were so discouraged. They were traveling in a somewhat backtrack way to places they had already been to. I can attest to you that when that happens, Charlie Garrett gets discouraged. If you don't believe that, ask him. Because when we went from Jericho to Jerusalem, we backtracked two or three times, and I was at my wit's end. And he knows that. He says, man, when you're in the lead and we're going in the right direction, you have all the energy in the world. But once we have to stop and backtrack, you're like a little sissy. And that's true of me. So I understand this with these people. All right? So they're discouraged. Other than the direction, the main difference in the names of the note of traveling from the wells of Bene Ja'akan, or the sons of twisting, according to the words, Moserah is, verse 6 continues, where Aaron died and where he was buried. Here it says Aaron, or very high, died and was buried in Moserah. This appears contradictory to Numbers 33 also. It says there, they moved from Kadesh and camped at Mount Hor on the boundary of the land of Edom. Then Aaron, the priest, went up to Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. On the first day of the fifth month, Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. Again, understanding that this is probably not the same place as Moserot, and that the name is given to the place based on the events the people faced, calling the place Moserah, or chastisement, fits the narrative of Aaron's death. Even if it is the same place, it could be that Mount Hor is located at a place called Moserah. Verse 6 continues, And Eliezer, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. Eliezer was installed as priest in the place of Aaron. His name means whom God helps. Verse 7, from there they journey to Gudgoda. Again, this is different than what happened in Numbers 33. There it says they went from Bene Ja'akan and camped at Hor Hagidgad, or Cavern of the Gatherers. Here, Gudgoda in Hebrew is Ha Gudgoda, or the gathered. Again, it doesn't say they encamped as it did in Numbers. It should be noted that the name Hagidgad and Ha Gudgoda are the same spelling with the exception of an additional letter H at the end of it. The H at the end of Gugoda. The H can simply mean in the area of Gudgod or Gidgad. Next, verse 7 continues, and from Gudgoda to Jopata. 
In Numbers 33, it says they went from Hor Hagid God and camped at Jopata. Thus, it is apparent, based on the similar spelling, that Ha Gudgoda and Hor Hagid God are the same area or a similar area with a slightly varied name. Jopata or Yot Bata means pleasantness. It is described as, verse 7 continues, a land of rivers of water. Eretz Nachale Mayim, land, wadis, water. The word translated as rivers here is Nachal. It signifies a wadi. It comes from the verb signifying to inherit or take as a possession. One could then translate this as land of inheritances of water. Our second thought, part A, pictures of Christ. What we have here is a continued picture of going from the law to the grace in Christ. Bene Akan means sons of twisting. It is reflective of life under the law. The law is given, and those under the law, from Adam on, inevitably twist it. Here, it says that the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bene Akan. A well is where one derives his source of water. It is a picture of those under the law drawing their spiritual water from the law, and thus they are known as sons of twisting. From there, they move to Moserah, meaning bond, but in the sense of chastisement. When one is bound to the law, he is in bondage to it, and in not meeting it, chastisement comes. It is at this spot where Aaron is said to have died and where he was buried. It then noted that Eliezer ministered in his stead. The picture was previously partially explained when Aaron's death was recorded in the book of Numbers. The transfer of the priesthood from Aaron, meaning very high and typical of Christ, but who is also of the line of the high priest of the law, to the son Eliezer, or whom God helps, represents the change of the priesthood from that which pictures Christ in his work, meaning very high, to that whom pictures Christ in his person, whom God helps. Christ, in his work, died in chastisement for the sins of those under the law. He did this by fulfilling the law and establishing the new covenant, becoming God's true and final high priest. Being fully God, it is he who helps those who come to him in faith. Aaron, representative of the law of Moses, died outside of the land of promise, because it is not by works of the law that one can enter, but through faith in Jesus Christ. The typology is set because the typology points to Christ. It then says that after Aaron died, the congregation moved to ha Gudgoda or the Gudgoda, meaning the gathered. It signifies those who were brought into the assembly of Christ. From there, it says they journeyed to Yopata, or pleasantness, a place described as a land of inheritances of water. In other words, it is the rivers of water that Christ speaks of in John chapter 7. In John 7, he says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This short parenthesis was given by inspiration through Moses to supplement the narrative of the two sets of tablets. There is the broken law in us, or there is the fulfilled law in Christ. There is living out the law, or there is being granted the righteousness of the fulfilled law. There is drawing water from the wells of the sons of twisting, meaning those under the law, or there is that land of inheritances of water from the source of true life, meaning the grace of God in Christ. In the end, the Lord is giving us beautiful pictures of Christ through Moses' words. With this understood, the narrative now transfers back to Moses' words concerning the time at Horeb. A greater priesthood lies yet ahead, but it cannot come while the old remains alive. Not until the first one is finished and dead can the new come in and the begin to thrive. But the first cannot end until all is complete. Only when that happens can the new one come in. When the law is fulfilled and the devil suffers defeat, then, joyfully then, will the new covenant begin. Let us put our trust in the one who has done it. Let us look to he who died on Calvary's tree. To him alone shall we our souls commit, because he alone has set us free.
Now, before we go on, I understand that that was a very complicated passage. If you think it was complicated for you to try to figure out what I'm talking about, think of me 10 weeks ago trying to figure it out from a text that nobody has commented on in any way, shape, or form outside of Charles Ellicott, whose conclusions I did not go with. But that is exactly what's being pictured in here. If you don't understand it, go back and read it until you do, because it's a very important picture of God's work in Christ, getting us away from the law into the grace of God in Christ. Our third thought, arise, begin your journey. It's verses 8 through 11. Prior to the parenthetical verses, the last thing that was mentioned was that Moses placed the tablets into the ark. The narrative now continues exactingly by going to those who would bear the ark, Levi. At that time, verse 8, ba'et hahiv, in the time, the that. It is the same words that open the chapter today. They, like those words, set the tone for what is said. It is, again, speaking of the time at Horeb. And so we see, again, that what is presented is not chronological, but rhetorical. It is while at Horeb, and during the time between the reception of the two separate sets of tablets that, verse 8 continues, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The holy duties included bearing the Ark of the Lord. That was granted solely to those of the tribe of Levi. The priests conducted certain duties that no other Levites could do, but the tribe of Levi as a whole was given the honors now named in this verse. This was based on what occurred after Moses came down the mountain with the original Ten Commandments. At that time, it said, remember, he went down there and he broke the Ten Commandments. Here, this is what's happening right now. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. Because of their defense of the honor of the Lord, he separated Levi to bear the ark. The Levites were also, verse 8 continues, to stand before the Lord to minister to him and to bless in his name to this day. Levites are shown elsewhere numerous times to praise and sing before the Lord. There were certain priestly duties that were reserved for them alone, but the Levites had many duties serving and ministering to the Lord. This was their portion. Verse 9 Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. This means that those of the tribe of Levi would not be granted a parcel of land as the other tribes would. They would be granted cities within the lands of the other tribes, and they would live off of the tithes and offerings of the people of the land. This will be expanded on later as Israel is given the particular instruction concerning their tithes. The Lord is their inheritance, and that means that what is offered from the people to the Lord would be distributed to them. As it says, verse 9 continues, the Lord is his inheritance. There's an emphasis in the Hebrew, Yehovah hu nachalato, Yehovah he, his inheritance. They will possess no tribal land, but rather the portion of the tribal lands that are dedicated and offered to the Lord would be for those of the tribe of Levi. Verse 9 continues, just as the Lord your God promised him. This is exactingly recorded in Numbers chapter 18. The rights and benefits of their tribe are defined there, and they will be expanded upon again here in Deuteronomy. With those words conveyed, Moses now continues further in his thoughts to the second time atop the mountain. Verse 10, as at the first time, I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. This returns to the thoughts spoken out in verses 9, 18, and 25. There the Lord spoke of the 40 days and nights that he interceded for Israel. What is obvious is that the connection to Levi here is a part of that. Israel sinned, but Moses called for those who would defend the honor of the Lord to come forward and kill the offenders. Levi did. Moses was instructed to make another set of tablets, which he did. He was then instructed to place them in the ark, which he did. 
However, during the time on the mountain, Moses also petitioned the Lord for Israel. The Lord accepted Moses' petition, and he chose to not destroy Israel. Israel. We saw that in a previous sermon a couple weeks ago. In the process, he determined to reward the tribe who had stood up for his honor. That would have been a moot point if he had destroyed the people. But in his turning from his anger, he chose to reward Levi. Does everybody now see how exceptional the chronology of this book is? It makes no sense until you see why God is putting certain stories in certain locations. Everything has to follow. And if the Lord had destroyed Israel, remember he said, go, I'm going to make a nation out of you to Moses. And I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses petitioned for him not to do it. There would be no need for this chapter right here. That's why this is placed here as it is. It is marvelous when you understand what's going on. In other words, the point of what is said here is actually the continued scolding of Israel for their evil behavior, the mercy of the Lord, a demonstration of what pleases the Lord and what brought the people to the structure in which they now existed. The Lord was angry enough to destroy all of the people, but he graciously forgave them through the mediation of Moses. At the same time, he elevated the tribe of Levi because of their forsaking even their own relations in putting the honor of the Lord first. In doing so, Levi was given a special honor that would continue throughout all of Israel's history. It is with these points highlighted that Moses next says, verse 11, finishes us up today. Then the Lord said to me, arise. Begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The word arise surely has a double meaning here. First, it said in verse 925, thus I prostrated myself before the Lord. Forty days and forty nights I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. In telling Moses to arise, it signifies that his decision was made. And that decision was to arise begin your journey. The single word conveys both events. Arise from before me, I have forgiven, and arise from this place and make your journey. In the chronology of events, it will still be an extended period of time before they actually depart from Horeb, but the assurance has been made. The Lord has said to Moses, let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. Instead, Moses would lead the people, Israel, and in his leading, they would go in and possess the land promised to their fathers. At this time, Moses had no idea that this would mean an extended period in the wilderness while entire generation would perish. But the promise of the Lord would stand as testified to by the fact that he is there with Israel right now on the east side of the Jordan. Though seemingly disjointed and obscured when we started, You can now see that the passage we have looked at is marvelously placed in the ongoing narrative. Each section is carefully building up the contents of the book so that nothing is left unattended for the future generations to read and to understand all that has occurred in Israel's history. Further, what is presented shows us the very heart of God concerning countless points of his character and of proper theology. He wants us to know that the law cannot save anybody. But he can. He wants us to understand our need and his ability to fill that need. He wants us to shun self and to, in turn, rely on him. And he shows us the benefits of what doing so will be. And more, the Lord is showing us, through Moses, that true mediation can overcome even the greatest of evils and offenses against him. Now, thank God for Jesus who does that for us. Because we've all come to the place where we thought, I can never be saved by God when we understood what Christ did. And yet he did it for Moses. In this, we can see the absolute surety we possess. Moses petitioned for Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. Christ Jesus never ceases to mediate on our behalf. If the Lord forgave an entire nation of its offenses because of Moses' human pleas, How much more can we be certain that we are forever safe in our salvation because of the Lord's petition for us? That's the lesson that we need to learn from this passage right here. Let us trust in this and let us be confident in it. To say otherwise is to raise our own faults and our own failings above the cleansing and sanctifying power of Christ's work. Such can never be. Rest in Christ. 
trust in Christ, and be confident of the effectiveness of the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ for you. This is the story that we're seeing. And I know when we started, Albert Barnes, I love the guy. We got his full New Testament commentary back there. I read the whole thing word for word when I met the Lord. It's about this thick and the words are so small you have to use a, uh, uh, what are you, a magnifying glass. I love the guy, but he was plain wrong in this. You have to be careful when you read commentaries or even listen to sermons by Charlie Garrett. Go home and read. And make sure that you check these things out. But these, these words are not easy. I understand that. And I understand that the analysis is very difficult. But when you go back and you read it again in your quiet time, you'll see that it is a beautiful picture of what Christ has done for us. Actually, two separate beautiful pictures of that. And then the final part that we went through is more beautiful pictures of Christ's mediatory ability. Here, a human can petition the Lord and he can save an entire nation of people. And we have the Lord Jesus for all of eternity before God. He can certainly save one of you. That's the lesson that we have. The gospel is that Christ died for your sins. He is the one that paid the penalty for your sins. Christ was buried, proving that he was dead. So his death was true and it was effective because Christ rose again on the third day. It proved that he had no sin of his own and it proved that he is God. Those are two indisputable proofs from this. All right. And this particular passage that we're looking at today takes care of a heresy known as Valentinism because there are teachers out there. I talked about this during the doctrine sermon that say that Jesus Christ was created in Mary's womb. I'm sorry. He was not created. He came all the way from Adam all the way through. And that's pictured by those two separate tablets. He was not created by God independently. He came through Adam. He's called the seed of David. All right. That can't be if he was created in Mary's womb. All right. It's a heresy. Be careful what you believe and who you listen to. Jesus Christ is fully human. And that's why all of these genealogies and all of these obscure stories are given in the Old Testament is because they're all pointing to him and the people that he issued from. And yet he issued without sin because his father is God. Mary is the human receptacle. He is God, the father. And together there is a child born without sin. That's what we just just went through this past week, the glory of Jesus Christ. Call on him today. Be reconciled to God through the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And praise God, you will be saved forever. All right? I got a closing verse here for you from Hebrews 7. It's verse 25. Therefore, here it is. He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. To the uttermost. People that say you can lose your salvation diminish the work of Jesus Christ. They diminish his shed blood and they diminish his mediatorial role. And I always get the question, I brought it up a couple weeks ago, what if somebody purposely walks away from the Lord? First, that would be a mental person. Doesn't even know his own actions. So that's out. But secondly, that's saying that God made a mistake in sealing him in the first place. And it's also elevating that person's opinion above God's covenant in Christ. It cannot happen folks. Next week is Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 22. This is why to him, our shouts we raise and to him, we do applaud. It's entitled, he is your praise and he is your God. That'll be our 35th Deuteronomy sermon. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. But he also has expectations of you as he prepares you for entrance into his land of promise. And so follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? Now I have a question. This should not be hard, but it might be. Every time I think I've got an easy one, nobody answers it. And then every time I think I've got this, nobody's going to get this. Somebody calls it out before I even finish the question. So... (laughs) What book and chapter is the last to mention the tribe of Levi? Book and chapter. You could say Malachi, right? Because uh, the sons of Malachi, you Levites, right? I'm, uh, you sons of Levi, he's talking about, oh, that's not the case because Jesus speaks of... Jesus, yeah, Jesus speaks of the Levites in the Gospels, doesn't he? There was a Levite walking along. You say, man. Hebrews? 
Hebrews. A Hebrews, it mentions the tribe of Levi because Levi paid tithes through his yes. father, uh, what's his, uh, Jacob, and Jacob paid through Isaac, and Isaac paid through Abraham. Hebrews, right? Uh, Wrong. Revelation. revelation. Oh, you're getting close. We're getting close. Where he mentions all the tribes. What chapter? Hurry up. What chapter? Tell me, Rhoda. Hurry. Tell me. Uh, what chapter? <laughs> chapter seven. You got it. Good job. I've got a. I've got a car for you. When you come up, you can take another one to your, uh, to your uh, nephew. Very good. You guys really banged that one out. I. You know. I just. I'm so embarrassed because I just finished chapter seven in the uh, daily commentary a week or two ago, and nobody read it. Apparently, I, I'm sitting here all by myself, folks. He read it. He didn't remember it. Yeah, remember the trash can exploding in the movie last night? You got to remember things after oh, you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we watched part of a movie last night, and uh, there was a trash can that exploded. And so you want to remember if you watch that movie again that a trash can's going to explode, so you don't get scared, right? Yeah, but Charlie watched it a year ago, and he could remember every single part of the entire movie. And I watched it three times, and I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> there you go. Got to, got to, got to stay awake when you read the Bible commentaries, okay? Shame on everybody that says they read those Bible commentaries and didn't remember that. If you don't, that's fine. You're excused. All right. I got a poem for you, and then we'll be done. All right. This is called Two Tablets of Stone Like the First. At that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, so you shall do, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood too. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets again plainly, the tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark away from the eyes of me. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first as planned, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me before saying, Adieu. And then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. This is where they have stayed. Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of ben Akan to Moserah, so they were led. And where Aaron died and where he was buried, and Eliezer, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. From there they journeyed to Gudgoda, as the Lord had planned, and from Gudgoda to Jopaha, a rivers of water land. At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day, according to his word. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, as you now know quite well, just as the Lord your God promised him, just as the Lord your God did tell. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain, forty days and forty nights, that time did accrue. The Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose to not destroy you." Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people as you live, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to them give. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us, your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word is so clear once it's studied and once it's understood that there are no contradictions, there are no errors. We don't need to go to lesser texts to find out something that somebody has changed purposefully in order to make something easier for us when in fact you've given us the correct answer in the original already. Thank you that it's supported by the Greek text as well, so that we know for certain that somebody didn't go in and purposefully mess up your word, but that it's protected, it's preserved for the people of God to read it and to understand that you are giving us pictures of your own dear son, our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this word, which is so precious to us. Thank you for the glory that it reveals. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your wonderful word and for who it portrays, our Lord Jesus. And so it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. At uh, communion today, and I uh, had told you that Sergio is going to do the communion, and then he waffled on us, and he said, I want you to do the main part of it, and I'll just do the blessing. So 
he uh, he doesn't feel confident enough to do the whole thing. So I'm just giving him a hard time. He just asked me to do it together with him. That's all. I'm just I'm just giving him a hard time. So we get the instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul wrote these words: "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread." He would have taken it. Now pick up the bread. Not the you can't break the uh, plate. <laughs> break the bread. He took bread and he gave his blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Hamotzilechem Min Haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. The second thing. Yes, you can. Don't break it. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Aburi Pri HaGefen. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Bless the people online first. And pick, pick them both up and present them and the body and the blood of the Lord. Body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're just the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> hey, you first. Body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Is your body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I need that out of the The body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, garlic. Mm. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep twisting that arm. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gotta do it. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
הגוף והדם של ישוע המשיח. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Okay, now you don't know you're giving final comments and a prayer. <laughs> uh, uh, final comments. Whatever's uh, on your uh, mind. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, well, Merry Christmas has already been passed, so, uh, but uh, it's been a wonderful Christmas. It is Rhoda's and my blessing, privilege, and honor to be here. Um, we've had the most wonderful time um, spending this Christmas with you, uh, with Charlie and family. Um, and uh, yeah, so New Year, we'll see you in next year, uh, Lord willing. Yay. And we trust him that he's got everything in his hands and his control. Right. Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for this time, God, that we can gather together as one family uh, because of your son, Jesus, because of what he's done on the cross for us, Lord. And he's resurrected, Lord, and this we rejoice that we now have eternal life. Lord, thank you for Pastor Charlie who delivered this wonderful message today. I pray that uh, many will take it to heart, Lord, as, uh, as it is the most important and most valuable lesson we can ever learn, Lord, and that we can pass it on to others uh, who are still here, Lord, and amongst us, so they may know your great love for us. We praise you and we thank you. Amen. 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 Okay, before we uh, close, uh, we got to go to break so that you can say goodbye to the people online. Merry, Happy New Year, and tomorrow is my son's birthday. So, it's the first birthday that he has ever had as an engaged man. And so, there you go. Happy birthday to Thor, and Happy New Year to everybody. And here we go. One, two, three. Okay, we love you. Happy New Year. Be blessed, and we'll see you next year. God bless you all. Bye-bye.